Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by my friend Neil Rogachevsky, uh, teaches at Yeshiva University, is a professor there and associate director, I believe, of the Strauss Center on Torah and Western Thought, a student of political philosophy uh, and Judaism, uh, written on both, a uh, PhD in history from Cambridge University. So lots of diverse credentials that you bring to this conversation about Israeli's Declaration of Independence. And I guess most importantly, that you've written a book that shortly uh, to appear from Cambridge University Press, should have appeared already, frankly, but that's how university presses are, I guess. I shouldn't, maybe we'll take this out of the final version so as not to offend uh, the Cambridge, the powers that be there at Cambridge. Excellent book, which I've read in galleys, uh, Israel's Declaration of Independence, the history and political theory of the nation's founding moment that you wrote with your co-author, uh, Dove Ziegler. So, Neil, thank you for, for joining me today. Great to be with you, Bill. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And I, I was talking yesterday, telling someone, a friend, that uh, we were going to have this conversation about Israel's Declaration of Independence. And this friend who's well-educated and interested in things Israeli and and Zionist and 20th century uh, history and so forth, uh, said, uh, and I, I must say, I would have had this reaction a few years ago, probably. I didn't know there was an Israeli Declaration of Independence, which is kind of striking that uh, it's not considered, you know, it's not, not something everyone knows about in terms of the founding of the state of Israel. So uh maybe just say a word about what, what is it when does it appear you know what uh, how does it fit into the, the what was happening in 1948 and you know and, and just before that as well great yeah so may 14th 1948 uh david ben gurion um sort of the de facto leader at that point of the issue the jewish community in palestine um assembles local dignitaries rabbis fellow politicians um, in the Tel Aviv Mu Tel Aviv National Museum in Tel Aviv on uh, Rothschild Boulevard. Not the nicest uh, museum in the whole world, but it was chosen because it was thought to be less susceptible to Egyptian bombard bombardment. Um, the War of Independence was about to begin. There was a much bigger theater down the street, and they thought, oh, the Egyptians would target that. We might as well do it in this uh, smaller um, venue. Um, and, this war and the war had already begun. I mean... Uh, so yeah, so the war had already begun. So the British, um, the British were set. The end of the British mandate had been set for midnight. Uh, you know, the May, the between May fourteenth and May fifteenth. Um, so the British were departing, um, and the thought was, and more than thought, W. Ben Gurion had great intelligence to this effect that the invasion of surrounding Arab armies, five Arab armies, was to commence immediately upon the British departure. But the war had already had already begun. There, the scholars typically divide um, Israel's war of Inde independence into two stages. Um, the first stage commenced um, after you know, the, the fall winter of 1947, um, once the UN, UN uh, decides uh, to partition the land of, of Palestine. We can talk about that a little bit. So thus commences a so-called civil war stage of the war of independence, you know, fight fighting between the Jewish and Arab uh, communities. Um, and then after Israel's declaration, May 14th, um, the major invasion commences. And uh, the Jews had sort of, you know, held their own, had done pretty well, even though there was some heavy slutting um, in the first stage of the war, but in March and April, um, they'd scored some important victories or stored, sort of stabilizing um, their presence. Uh, but Ben Gurion, who you know had, who was the most well-informed person, he had very dark thoughts about whether, 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 whether it could, whether this could be carried on, whether the Yishuv, the Jewish community, could survive the impending onslaught from real armies, real, you know, the Egyptian army, the Jordanians, the Syrians, heavily armed, um, and the Jewish community at that point um, was sorely lacking in both men and ammunition. Um, so Ben Gurion, it was a very joyous occasion. Um, when he read read the declaration, that that room was probably one of the most rapturous rooms in in, in Jewish history, um, and uh, there was rejoicing. You know, immediately after this, uh, you know, quick ceremony, um, there was you know, you know, horas and dancing in the streets in Tel Aviv. Ben Gurion left; he didn't participate in, in in this and had very dark thoughts. He immediately went to to deal with the the military impending um, invasion. Um, he just mustered later, we see he had a diary, he mustered a few terse points, said at 4 p.m. we declared independence, the nation was jubilant, but I mourn amidst the rejoicers. So his thoughts really were turned towards military matters and this existential challenge, which was you know only gearing up on May 14th. And Jerusalem is already partly cut off from Tel Aviv, right, by the 
Jordanian yeah, Jer- Legion or yeah, Jerusalem had been blockaded. Um, there were you know, dignitaries who otherwise may have attended the ceremony in Tel Aviv were unable to do so. A few of them um, were brought in by you know these these sort of you know, very very rustic to say the least prop planes. Um, but um, yeah, no the the um, you know solidifying a firm connection between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem had already been uh, you know a you know, a, um, you know a, ma- a major major aspect of the war um, to that point, and it would continue to be so. Um, Jeru- the Jews of Jerusalem were under strict rationing; they would be um, for the ensuing months until finally um, later that summer. You know, more more reliable connection was ensured at you know he- heavy cost of of blood. So this declaration is proclaimed. It's a official document we'll talk about it in in a few minutes uh, in terms of its uh, political theory as it were and a little bit of relationship to the american declaration and so forth but um uh, but it is it's read aloud but sort of unlike the american declaration i guess where there's a convention that people know is going on and there's a draft it's somewhat circulated and and then proclaimed uh, by representatives of the states in a sort of organized matter it's a little bit ad hoc obviously because it's not as a you know, they don't have a, it's not like a constitution where they have a government that can set up, as it were, uh, send delegates. Uh, this seems much more, uh, the more ad hoc, more uh, um, suddenly sort of, uh, well, to talk about it, I mean, do, do, do people know about it ahead of time? Have, have people dis- debated it much in public ahead of time? Is it, or is it just sort of sprung on people by Ben Gurion? Oh, it's the the people, the Jewish community of Palestine are left in the dark about the process of the construction of a Declaration of Independence. And more than that, we can we'll, we'll probably get to this as well. There was great uncertainty as to the, you know, whether whether you know the kind of independence that would be proclaimed that day. It was clear that some some version of a state was going to be declared, but the specifics of that were not known. Um, I like I, I, you know, I like simply to tell you know tell tell this anecdote to you know conveys this point you know many people in the room were you know surprised to learn that the name of the state was Israel and that 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 wasn't clear indeed when it was telegrammed to Washington you know on on May fourteenth when you know the Jewish agency's representative in Washington um, had, you know you know was it was in touch with the State Department you know President Truman they 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 didn't know yet you know the name of the state so what this, else could it know, have been I mean what were this there were alternatives uh, Judah was considered um, there were few few other alternatives talked through but yeah the, but the you know Israel came to be this was voted upon actually um, in you know several several days before um, the um, you know, May 14th but 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 only a few days um, uh, before. Um, so that that wasn't widely known. Um, and yes, a process of construction was sort of frenetic. I mean, you could say you could trace it. Um, the be- the beginning, uh, you know, the be- beginning of the beginning was sort of late April 1948. Um, uh, this process was delegated da- you know, down the bureaucratic chain um, to the, you know, there was a guy called Pinchas Rosen, known at, known at the time as Felix, Felix Rosenbluth. He was a, you know, first justice minister, minister of the state to be. And he was sort of scrambling around doing a million things, um, f- towards the end of the British mandate. Uh, which laws should we keep from the British mandate? Which laws should we abolish? Um, how do we end the, the white paper restricting Jewish immigration? He had a million things on his plate to deal with. The, uh, you know, some kind of proclamation of independence was one of these. Um, and he, in the first instance, delegated it down the chain um, to various people. Um, and it sort of remained within like this, this you know, burgeoning um, bureaucracy of the state um, until just, you know, a few days before independence when it became an urgent, urgent matter of debate um, by, uh, you know, on the part of the leadership of uh, the issue of the Jewish community. And the drafts were not... Uh... I think well known until somewhat recently. That's what makes possible your your book, which does focus. We'll, we'll get to this on you know what's in some of the drafts and, and and what the political theory, as it were, the competing political theories of the Israeli Declaration of Independence might have been and and, and what what it ended up being. But and that's not something that people were talking about in 1949 or 1959 or 1969, right? I mean that's. Uh, yeah, no, it 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 really um it it really wasn't. I mean, there it, it was always known um that there was this drafting process. There were you know various people um who had been been involved with um you know drafting the you know early earlier versions, earlier texts of um of uh, the declaration. It wasn't a it wasn't a it wasn't a it wasn't um it wasn't it wasn't a secret or wasn't you know was wasn't something totally unknown. However, it wasn't 
focused on, and this goes back to your you know, your first, you know, the, the anecdote with which you began, it really hasn't been, uh, you know, the, the Declaration of Independence or other matters which concern sort of the nature of the Israeli regime didn't get a lot of airtime for, through much of Israeli history. And there's a good reason for that. People were dead focused on the war, you know, the war, the, you know, the war, the war, you know, the inc- incredible story of the War of Independence. Um, you know, the sub- subsequent wars, Mil- military matters were so absorbing all, uh, you know, uh, absorbed all the greatest minds in 48. And subsequently, um, that studies in Israeli history and Israeli politics were, were you know, that that that's that's where most of the energy um, and intelligence um, went. Um, and there's also the matter, I mean, this sort of, you could, you could say it's a Lincolnian point. So we're, you know, we're entering the 75th year of uh, Israel's anniversary, you know, now sort of the founding generation is sort of, you know, passed on, but that's a, you know, fa- fairly recently, like in, you know, in the near past, if you wanted to you know, find out what the founders were thinking, you know, you know, you know, Ben Gurion died in, you know, 73, but, you know, Shimon Perez is, you know, protege was there. You want to ask what the founders were thinking, you, you go talk to them, they're around. So that generation is now how passed on. And I think as a result of this, there's sort of growing, um, in, you know, growing interest in looking at the works they left behind, but sort of, you know, like, of, you know, um, to try to orient, um, for Israelis to orient themselves on key questions on, you know, the nature of state. Oh, what are we doing here? What kind of state are we going to have? What's the character of our democracy? What's the relationship between, um, you know, religion, religion and state? What kind of rights are we guaranteed? No, that's good. I mean, I just, I suppose that, in the American case, I mean, July 4th is celebrated very early on. There are celebrations of it even after the new, after the Constitution is is signed. And July 4th actually remains central more than the date of the signing of the Constitution or the ratification of the Constitution, which is an interesting thing, the centrality of the Declaration. I guess independence remains central, but educate me on this. In, in, in Israel, it's a holiday very right away and that everyone understands it's a super important moment the declaration of ind- of the state but it's more the founding of the state than the the document isn't as central as just the fact of the liberate of the of the of the of the of a new of a jewish state after 2000 years yeah that's absolutely right yom Ha'atzmaut, uh israel's independence day is a is a, is a huge day it's a national it holiday day, it's always right? been it's, it's may yeah, 14th oh, yeah. it's when ben Gurion yeah. gives this yeah speech yeah so it's in israel it's celebrated on the hebrew calendar hey but yeah right. you know may, may, may 14th 1948 um but no yeah it's it's always been you know a, a, you know the the fact of independence uh you know the um the material change from being ruled by others to self-rule has been you know, has, has been celebrated um, and, and and rightly so, uh, but the text lacks less so. But I think they, there's 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 growing interest in the text in recent years. But the fact that it hasn't um, had this uh, mythical mythical hold on the Israeli mind actually tells us something, and it it speaks to what I, what I've called I think that amb- you know the, the Israel's Declaration of Independence is a beautiful document, but it's also somewhat an ambiguous document. Um, it's hard to find a community in Israel. Which would define its mission or its you know the purpose of Israel or the mission of Israel in terms of you know doctrines that come out of the Declaration of Independence. It has sentiments which people people refer to you know it's just freedom, justice, and peace in line with the you know vision of the you know of the prophets of Israel. It has you know there are aspects of it which are you know quite famous and you know everyone does know the text that appears in civics textbooks and so on. But it hasn't quite captured. Um, you know, the public imagination, the way the American Declaration, at least at various times in history, has. And I guess, you know, this just one more thing on the American. Is Jefferson has a separate status as author of the Declaration. He then becomes president and so forth. It's very important afterwards, too. And then Madison and Hamilton more on the Constitution. Um, but in a funny way in Israel, because Ben-Gurion is both central to the Declaration and then the first prime minister for what, 15 years or something. I mean, it sort of gets blurred together, right? I mean, it's as if Washington had also done the Declaration and the Constitution, you know? <laughs> and so it becomes then a debate about Ben-Gurion and Ben-Gurion and Begin and Ben-Gurion and successors. And it's less, I guess, you know, the focused on the the document and as a oh, sort of having an independent standing. 
No, that that's a that I think is a profound point. You know, so, you know, as Herodotus tells us, Solon famously left Athens after you know drafting its uh, constitutional laws for ten years just to you know ensure that they would follow the laws and not not his will. You know that that didn't quite happen um, in Israel, and yeah, all of this is 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 uh, confounded. But one other point of that, I mean, it's just so when you're studying it, so this this in a way it, this cuts the other way from a certain point of view. If you're studying the American founding. You have many choices. You look at yes, the U.S. Declaration is so central, and we you know we we can understand why. But you know, there's a Constitution, there's a Federalist Paper. They're great work, works written by the founders. You know, people you know stretch, stretch to Tuckville and so on. That's actually not the case in Israel, but you know for you know some 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 reasons we can, we can get into. Um, Israel's Declaration is really the only text from the founding period which attempts to speak about foundational topics of of political thought, which attempts to characterize the nature of the state. There's supposed to be a constitution. Um, it's written, you know, one 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 part of Israel's declaration, which is a dead letter. It promises a constitution that that never occurs for you know some complicated reasons. And therefore, Israel's te- Israel's declaration was left as the text which you can look to to try to figure out, oh, what were what kind of state were the Israelis trying to found in 1948? And we should discuss that in a minute. Obviously, as you say, the the, the political theory of the of the do- document itself, which is so interesting and that's full of tensions and so forth. But I'd say one last point on that. I, I'm struck from an American, you know, point of view, point of view, of, uh, or to say outside of Israel, histories of uh, this. I think this fits with this. I'm sh- I was struck decades ago on this. There are many histories of Zionism, and some of them are written from different points of view, of course, and there are big controversies about Jabotinsky and Ben-Gurion and the revisionists, and the, you can, well, it's endless, right? And sort of, and, and they're all quite interesting, many are quite interesting, and but that they treat the founding of Israel as an episode in the history of Zionism, which is true in a way, but not as, but we sort of like treating the American founding as, well, there was a lot of interesting stuff in the colonies in the 18th century and a lot of thinkers and a lot of influences. And people write about this, of course, of different political philosophers. And this is just kind of like a another chapter in the you know history of, uh, uh, of what was happening here on this continent, which isn't the way some historians take it, because they want to minimize the importance of the declaration, but it's never been the the orthodox, so to speak, account, I'd say, of America and the founding and, uh, and the nation beginning in 1776 and, and based on these universal principles and all that. And I've always been struck, I should say a word about this. I mean, people haven't studied until quite recently, and I think this book will have a big influence on this, the founding of Israel as a founding. I think it's an awfully interesting one. It's very problematic, very challenging. It's full of cha- of. of of problematic aspects and contradictory aspects and so forth. And if you're interested in foundings, which you should be if you're interested in politics and political science and history, this is a pretty remarkable founding. And yet it's it's in a weird way shoehorned into this longer history from Herzl to, you know, whatever, to Bibi Netanyahu. And it's just kind of another thing. I'm exaggerating a little bit. It's another thing that happens along the way. And I mean, you, I mean, I don't, is there anything you said about this sort of why hadn't people focused more on the founding of the state? Why aren't there courses all over in Jewish studies departments or in Middle East studies on the founding of the state of Israel as opposed to the history of Zionism, I guess, is my question. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a very good point. Um, and uh, we, we would have to get into you know a lot of you know, the question of dias- you know, the way di- diaspora looks at developments and the way you know, things are understood within within Israel itself. Um, but I, I, I would echo your sentiment. I think that's a, that's a mistake. And it's something actually that, you know, Ben Gurion and the other authors in 1948 had to reckon with as they were, you know, looking, you know, you know, deciding what to say, what to say about the nature of the state, you know, Herzl and, you know, the, the history of Zionism, you know, had to be acknowledged. Herzl's name obviously is, you know, mentioned in the, in the Declaration of Independence, although it was left off and, you know, certain, um, you know, certain, certain early, early versions of, of the text. So he, he had to be in there, but that was an acknowledgement of his, you know, his, poli- his role, his political actions, rather than, you know, his, you know, the vision that he, that he, um, that he gave for the nature of the Jewish state to be created. Herzl's genius was his, you know, his, his, uh, his political organizing, his vision, his understanding of the world historical forces, what needed to be done. I mean, you know, statesmen at the highest level, but when you look for what you look into, you, when you, when you study a and when you look into, 
you know, his his vision as to what, you know, you know, political theory matters like, oh, what, what what's what's the foundation of the state? What's what's it going to look like? There's some interest there. Um, but that really wasn't his primary concern, you know, in the early, you know, late 19th and early 20th century. He wasn't thinking as, you know, Madison is a Hamilton. He wasn't going into the, you know, the architecture of government. He wasn't going into its founding principles. So it actually doesn't you couldn't turn in 1948 to, to Herzl and say, oh, we're going to. You know, Herzl is going to tell us how we're going to, you know, what principles we're going to, you know, are, are going to be the basis um, of our state. And that left in, in 1948, that left, um, you know, Ben Gurion and the other founders to do their best to try to, you know, to, you know, think, think politically, think foundationally and articulate, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the kind of state that they wanted um, to found. Yeah, well, that's very good. That's good. And that's a good transition to actually let's talk about the declaration, because I guess another way of saying what you're just saying is. There's no John Locke. I mean, there's no one thinker. Of course, there were other strands of thought in America, ranging from Puritan and religious to radical versions, more thinkers more radical than Locke. And this has been studied a great by many, many good historians and intellectual historians and political theorists. But there is, at the end of the day, a real political philosophy from which the Declaration flows. So let's talk about that. What 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 were the competing political philosophies or competing maybe just thoughts if they were quite philosophies uh, that were there and 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 what how was this shown in the drafts and then i want to get of course to ben gurian's absolutely central role which i think we've sort of touched on here already but uh, i was struck by reading your book i mean just it's you just that can't be uh overestimated but anyway first i mean so we'll talk about the declaration what does it say i mean what what you know most people let's just assume most people haven't read it that they can get your they can go online and read it and there's a translation on the i believe on the israeli government website it's for in english for those of us who because hebrew isn't great so but still what what does it say what what did the draft say what were the competing you know elements of it and so forth yeah, so studying this is why it's important, as as you say, to study the the final text of the Declaration and its pre drafts. The way I the way I characterize the study is you studying the Declaration tells you the path Israel ultimately embarked on, but it also tells you some paths not taken, and that you see that over the evolution of the major. There are ma- there are many drafts. You know, this thing you know stood in bureaucratic committee. There were edits. Some of those were substantial. Some were less substantial. But you could really posit at least four central pre drafts. And, you know, it's sort of, you know, um, crudely, you could you could characterize the first one as basically, you know, following the American Declaration of Independence, a liber- you know, the natural rights doctrine of the American Declaration combined in a certain interesting way um, with a Jewish Jewish justification for statehood. That was option one. Option two. And who, and who does that? Let's talk about those drafts a little bit. They're actually interesting, even though it's a little bit in the weeds, but it's pretty amazing. So these are you say bureaucratic, but you make it sound like there was an actual functioning bureaucracy but it's a much more uh, ad hoc than that isn't it really i mean yeah it is i mean there there is a the story is, you, you know, tell about this guy's oh yeah at, so oh yeah Seder, okay so you know at on, on, on passover of 1948 and you know, so okay yeah so let's go into that i mean that's that's just an, an astonishing story so as i said this guy pinchas rosen felix Rosen rosenbluth um you know the justice minister to be um he's got this um young he's you know a a, a young um young uh, lawyer um, slash government worker who's not even in government full time. He's the son of a prominent Tel Aviv lawyer named Mordechai Baham, um, 33 years old in 1948. Um, as I say, Rosenbluth is very busy assembling other tasks. He calls um, um, Baham into his office um, in um, later April um, 1948 and says, you know, we've got to prepare a, a proclamation. Once once the British leave, we've got to prepare, um, you know, a statement which, uh, you know, says, you know, which uh, legitimizes the authority, like is like the that, that's the most important aspect of the, the authorities which are declaring independence are le- legitimate bodies, henceforth to be considered states. That has to be in there. Uh, but it also, Rosenblum says, um, has to say something of how we got to this point. Um, so it's unclear if he gave him more specific instructions, like, oh, it should, you know, it should, should it be a substantive text? Should it be simply a procedural document? But this guy was sort of, um, you know, had, you know, was sort of at a loss for what to, what, what to do. And the story goes that he was having, you know, Passover, Passover lunch with his family, um, you know, Saturday, April uh, 23rd, 1948. And he was reminded that there was, a, you know, an interesting rabbi, um, a rabbi named Harry uh, Davidowitz. Um, who uh, had immigrated from America to Palestine in, 19, in uh, the mid-1930s. He lived nearby in Tel Aviv. 
um, you have this major task in front of you. Why don't you go consult with him, consult with his rabbi, see what you come up with. Um, so on that Saturday afternoon, he went to pay a house, co- house this call. This rabbi on... had translated uh, Shakespeare. Am I making this up? Yeah. So, so, yeah. So this was, so, you know, it just, it just gets better and better. This rabbi had been, yeah, the, the, the translate, uh, he had, he had translated, um, he, he was of independent means. He wasn't, I don't think professionally employed as a, um, as, as, as a rabbi in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, but he was sort of a literary translator. He translated um, the, uh, the works of Shakespeare, which were standard works in Israel for many decades. Um, he translated, um, you know, from from uh, the Judeo Arabic, a, a text that had been attributed to Maimonides. So someone who's very who's interested in um, the great work, you know, great, great, great. And had been a conservative works. rabbi in the U.S. Am I right? About yeah, he'd been ortho- he, not orthodox. It wasn't exactly. A, yeah, yeah, he but, had. He, yeah, he'd been. Yeah, he'd been influenced by progressive. He grew up. I mean, he'd studied in yeshiva the full I full see. religious education. He sort of drifted in a you know, progressive direction um, later on. Uh, but extremely an extremely learned um, fellow. His wife was a first you know, was a you know the, uh, you know an art critic for uh, the Jerusalem for the Palestine Post, soon to be Jerusalem Post. Um, and so he had and he had in, in Tel, Tel Aviv, nineteen forty, didn't have a university like it, it had like a central library. It was like a bad library. He was you know had an extensive library. Um, and so somehow, and some of the details here are very murky. There's you know a lot of a lot of the you know the, the you know the relationship between Baham and Davidowitz. Much of it relies on family lore. One has to say. But what's clear what happened, so, you know, ba- ba- you know ba- from, from what we can tell, he spends some time in um, the, li- uh, the rabbi's library that afternoon in consultation with the rabbi, and he copied out core text of the Anglo-American political tradition, um, the English, English Bill of Rights, 1689, um, the American Declaration of Independence, um, and aspects of the King James uh, Bible. And then he goes home. Either with input from from the rabbi, you know, I strongly suspect the rabbi was was involved, and he writes a Declaration of Independence, which you know tries to you know blend you know life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. He mentions that phrase, you know, government, you know, you know, governments draw draw their draw their power from the consent of the governed. Um, he basically crafts a, a you know declaration for an independent Jewish state on that basis, while also beginning with you could say a theological you know quotes Deuteronomy right at the beginning. You know the you know because the Lord, where is the Lord God promised this land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and and their seeds after them. So he tries in this remarkable way to you could say combine Philadelphia and uh, Jerusalem in in Tel Aviv in the spring of 1948. Um, Yoram Shachar, the guy who. Israeli scholar who 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 first really saw and analyzed um, um, Baham's text um, no, noted noted this um, and this was really an interesting attempt but it was it didn't survive the editorial process of uh, the issue of bureaucrats a sort of very Anglo American approach to the question. So that draft is getting worked on and then there are other drafts and and. Bring that's us right. To, to the yeah, gym. that's right. So, so this follows. So, so, so it takes a turn in a labor Zionist direction afterwards, and the whole natural right um, teaching of um, the American Declaration, which which Baham had uh, you know tried to assert, is is basically edited out very quickly. Probably with the, with the help of Baham, also over time, he was involved in the editing process. He was you know very very committed to his first draft, but it didn't you know didn't didn't quite survive the confrontation with you know colleagues back in the office. So. It goes in that direction, um, and then um, there are various other there are various other attempts. Also, there's a fellow called Hirsch, Hirsch Lauterpacht, who is one of the you know the principal founders of international law in the 20th century. He writes a draft, um, which is that's sort of a you could say there the 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 final draft has several lineages, right? There's a Baham lineage, which is then edited in a labor Zionist direction. There's a Hirsch Lauterpacht dra- draft, which tries to deal with the you know questions of international law and legitimacy. Um, finally, it goes to Moshe Sharet, another principal player um, in the in this drama, Israel's Israel's second um, second prime minister, um, who um, produces the penultimate draft um, in, uh, in in the few days before independence, and he's very concerned with oh, how what's what's wh- how are um, how are the American authorities how are how is the UN going to respond to this? We need to do everything in our draft. Um, to win legitimacy from um, from the United States, principally as well as as well as, well as other powers, and then finally coming to um, David Ben Gurion um, in the night of the night between May thirteenth and May 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 fourteenth. It's crazy. Right? So this a, is all they, happening under the gun of the May fourteenth fifteenth deadline. I suppose the Americans had deadline were under the gun, sort of, but they didn't 
if it hadn't been July 4th, it would have been August 4th, right? It wasn't like here they really have to have it where well, they think they, they should have it at least, obviously, when they proclaim independence and they have to do that because of the UN deadline. Say a word just to expand the history that on the UN stuff, just so the, the UN has, I mean, just one forgets, I mean, if you're pro-Israel, you've you've grown to dislike the UN quite a lot over the decades subsequently, but one forgets how important that was. The uh, and just say a word about the history of that from in 47, 48, the UN. Yes. Yeah. So the UN, the question of the UN in a way was, you know, goes to the heart of the, the practical political issues as, as they were understood and contemplated in 1948. So the UN, um, after, you know, the British, British, British uh, announcer withdrawal. Um, the British Palestine are running for- Palestine under this mandate. Which itself exactly. is from the league from the league, I mean, of Na- league of nations. Yeah, I mean they conquer. They you know they win it before, and, right? Yeah, they win it. Win it from the Ottomans in 1917, and then that's that's formalized in the league of nations um, uh, a- after the war. Um, the British throw up their hands like a you know broke shivering British Empire in the wake of World War II. You know they they're 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 um, sick and tired of policing um, uh, the, the 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 conflict there. They announce they're leaving. They turn it over to the UN. The UN investigates. Then November 29th, 1947, 75th anniversary we recently celebrated, um, they decide on a partition of the land of Palestine into a Jewish state, an Arab state, and an international Jerusalem. Now this is a, this is very important because it's often when when the and this was in UN Resolution 181. When people talk about UN Resolution 181 today, then say, "Oh, it proclaimed." A Jewish state, right, or a Jewish state and a you know Arab, Arab state at most, but the kind of so if you look into the text of the revolution, what the UN had insisted upon, in which the world powers were also very um, attached to, it wasn't simply you know chick chack, you know um, British leave and you know we have you know these these states can run themselves however 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 they please. No, the UN attached like very severe. Um, strictures on these, you know, states or, or you know, quasi states to be. The UN was going to be there and supervise. They're going to be blue helm. Like this, none of this ever materialized. But in the resolution, oh, there was going to be UN supervision, um, sort of a UN police or UN regime force, really monitoring those states. Um, there had to be for for the states actually to be admitted to the UN later on. There had to be an economic union between the Arabs and Jews. Peace had to prevail. Um, all these, you know, they had to, you know, all these sorts of parliamentary offices had to be, you know, created. The UN was ultra specific on what uh, what what kind of, um, you know, benchmarks these uh, states to be um, w- w- would have to meet if they were to be considered um, states. Um, and so that that immediately that 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 in a way. So the, I mean, the, the you know, the details of U.N. Resolution 181 really set the political, you know, set the terms of the political debate for the for the Jews of Palestine going forward, because Arab, the Arab states right away, there's, you know, something, you know, uh, um, you know the Arab Arab higher committees like so, you know, conveyed in no uncertain terms. We're not we're not accepting any any partition. Um, we have we have no use for this. Um, the war broke out. Peace. Peace was like, you know, a, a, a dream right away. You know, the, you know, right after the the passing of the um, um, you, 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 uh, you re- resolution, um, you know, Jews are attacked in Jerusalem. The, 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 the war begins. So peace does not prevail. Um, and um, there's there's backtracking um, the powers of the world. America, you know, America becomes an interesting question. America had supported the partition plan, but there were actors in the State Department and elsewhere who wanted to you know you know back backtrack on this. And that was a diplomatic background the Jews had to face. And their 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 principal political concern, and Ben Gurion says this later, is oh, do we how how far do we commit ourselves to a UN process which is already a dead letter? But they need to be so to speak on the side of the UN or or or. Or, or more or less implementing the U.S. in order to keep U.S. and others on board, they need to be sort of on the side of we are doing what the U.N. authorized, not on the side of who cares about the U.N. This is oh, yeah. know, two, two thousand years of history here, and and you know we don't care about the U.N. and we're just declaring independence. Yeah, that latter point was a revision. That was a revisionist line through, throughout this, and there's a certain intelligence in it, right? The revisionists saw revisionists so meaning the revi- revisionist Zionist, Bacon, the, yeah, 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 the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the right right wing critics of the Ben Gurion line. They said, look, there's no this UN process is a farce. It's absurd. We just need to declare independence. If if we don't do this, um, the, we're the, you know so the foreign powers are going to impose something on us. But that wasn't the diplomatic line that Ben Gurion took. Ben Gurion. You know, in, in in fierce and agonizing debates with his colleagues, you know, advance precisely that. Yes, we need to we accept the general principle uh, that the UN 
um, genius, right? We accept the principle of partition and Jewish statehood, which uh, Resolution 181 loudly affirms, um, but we don't commit ourselves um, in any specific and legally enforceable way to the details of Resolution 181, including the borders that were specified in it, including all, all the economic union, whole, whole host of other things, because those have been totally blown away by the political developments in the meantime. You know, we're invaded. You know, the genocidal war has been launched launched against us. Um, the details of Resolution 181 are inoperative. Um, so Ben Gurion, that's his principal um, pr principal point on the diplomatic level in his Declaration of Independence. He says. You know, and this is pure, pure, uh, you know, pure Ben Gurion innovation in the final text. We recognize the strength of Resolution One Eight One, and um, we, you know, we we accept to work towards economic union. Um, we are, um, we're, we're we're not we're not we're not departing from that. But I'm not committing myself to, you know, every the the letter of UN Resolution One Eight One. That's that's uh, inoperative at this. And he stage. doesn't. So let's get in out of the text so on this yeah. issue of, I guess, what we call it, the grounds of sovereignty. You know, most it he cites you uh, the the text cites the resolution as, as I recall you 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 show, but doesn't make that the basis, uh, as it were, of the legitimacy of the Jewish state or of Jewish so sovereignty. Ab absolutely, that's a, that's you could say that's his key innovation in the Declaration and and in the founding of Israel. He 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 sort of downgrades it. He recognizes its importance as a diplomatic event on the you know sort of a way station on the road to um to uh, Israeli um, independence, but he asserts independence on the basis of what he calls a natural right, the natural right of the Jewish people, like all other nations, to claim sovereignty. That's the basis on which Ben Gurion and Ben Gurion alone. Um, asserts Israeli independence. And that was a fierce fight with his colleagues. His colleagues, many of them, you know, very distinguished, very distinguished lawyers. Um, sort of made, some of them had, you know, quite a legalistic mindset. Um, others were, you know, very, you know, like they were, you know, they're so attuned to what was, you know, diplomatic considerations in, in Washington, what, what was happening there. They were much more willing to say, you know, commit themselves in speech to the UN process. Oh, we're only, we're only following um, the UN process, where this, 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 the, the kind of independence we're declaring is a UN managed independence. So Ben Gurion breaks free from this, um, and he, um, I think, teaches his colleagues a lesson on the meaning of sovereignty. He says, "This is a moment to go, go to, to truly go for it." Um, the British are leaving. You don't, you don't get an opportunity like that, you know, every day when there's a void of political rule. So we just need to you know, go for it. And he had some support, you know, Golda Meir, future Prime Minister, others. Um, you know, other uh, others of his, you know, colleague, colleagues in the Labor Party. I mean, he, he had support. He wasn't totally alone in following this diplomatic line, but he really made this, you know, win out um, sovereignty on the basis of the Jews have a right to a state. And, it, and he uses the phrase and this gets out of the substance of the declaration. And you should walk us through some of the key sentences, phrases, you know, et cetera. Historic and natural right. Is that right? That, 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 that That's the ground of the state somehow. Yeah, the ground of the so okay, yeah. So what? So so how do we do this? Let's let's talk about the declaration. I'd say the declaration, um, you know, tries to do three things in Good. three three cent central areas. So the first I've already sort of covered. This is a question of sovereignty, sovereignty and national independence, the, the basis of national independence, and this is clearly clearly stated. This is you know ten out of ten. Ben Gurion does on, on this front on the meaning of national sovereignty. This state um, is a fully sovereign state. Um, it recognizes the, you know, it's, it's you know, it has gratitude for, you know, it, it gratefully acknowledges, you know, the role of UN um, in, um, in 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 recognizing this principle. But it's a state like any other; it exists in the world of states. Um, it will succeed or fall on the basis of its own, you know, on on the basis of its own arms, on the basis of its own um, success. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, try to fit itself into like a, you know, a vision for what the UN was trying to do. It's not. It's an it's an independent state, and that and that is contained in that in that um, idea of. Um, you know the net natural right of a state to be to be to be like all others. So that's on sovereignty, and I think the state and that you know it's no surprise that it, you know Israel has always been very strong on on this front. Oh, we're a sovereign state. We're you know we understand that we understand our ourselves as independent as acting um, independently, and that doesn't preclude diplomatic relations, peace treaties, whatever. But you know we're we're existing in a world of states, which was not a 
like you know it sounds to to an, to an american and you know that's you know it's it sounds like you know almost like a bromide um but in the in you know in in you know amidst of people who hadn't you know been a you know who had some for religious reasons philosophical reason had rejected state sovereignty or just you know the simple fact hadn't lived in you know an independent uh kingdom or, or or state for you know two millennia that's a you know major thing which he was able to do at the time so that's on sovereignty the second is on the question of um religion at religion and state i would say the basis so ben gurian this is again a ben gurian um innovation um and he he starts um he introduces this you know beautiful first first paragraph um to the declaration maybe we can just read it yeah read it that would be good since yeah, the first yeah. paragraph of our of the american declaration is so famous and when in the course of human events which seems to not have much room for religious intervention divine intervention i guess the israeli declaration is going to be a little different right yeah read it in english and of course the english is 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 quite different um eretz israel was a birthplace of the jewish people here their sp spiritual religious and political identity was shaped here they first attained to statehood created cultural values of national and universal significance and gave to the world the eternal book of books so in previous drafts this started with like a pretty like just general and bland statement because of a historic and traditional attachment to the land which jews have are already had it brackets right away any of the you know essential question of the, of the substance of what that historical and traditional connection may be ben gurion realizes he gets versions of the text which which go in that direction and he realizes it's not enough i've got to try to state state something on like the the actual meaning of um our, our our enterprise here about why the Jews are you know connected to this specific land and he tries in this paragraph right they created cultural values of universal significance and they gave to the world the book of books so you you dig into that and you like you start to see and this is where you know the dialogue between the particular and the universal uh come come you know, comes to be Ben Gurion is grasping here for a not merely like a simple national justification for a statehood like uh, that that can be read when you're talking about sovereignty oh other other states are you know other peoples are in, in, entitled yeah, to italy sovereignty for the too. italians yeah exactly uh, italy, italy for the italians yeah. this is yeah this isn't simply another uh, another nationalism what, what he tries to do here is to state the work of the jews that they've done in the land of israel has universal significance they gave to the world the book of books and therefore if that you know if that um you know work and the you know the the ideas or, or principles or treasures actually would be a better uh translation than the, the bad official english translation <laughs> that the israelis produced later on you know values no that they gave to the world treasures i.e treasures of universal significance if that you know if the, if those treasures are to, are to continue their way through world history the jews deserve sovereignty to carry on that mission that is sort of the universal Jewish justification um, that he reaches for um, in this first paragraph and which comes out in, you know, in, in different places of the text. So that is, you know, that is um, that's, um, I, I, you know, I think a beautiful sentiment. I think there's there's a lot there, but it's also in a way sort of ambiguous, right? Because it doesn't say the text doesn't say anything as to what these cultural values are. It doesn't say it says that you know, it, it's you know it speaks of the Bible. It speaks to the importance of the Bible, but it doesn't. And I don't really blame Ben Gurion for this. It would take you know genius at the level of Maimonides to like you know or, or some some grade in Jewish history to truly distill like you know the principles of the Bible in a few sentences. But you know it doesn't it doesn't say anything like oh what are those what are those treasures that 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 come from the well, maybe Bible? better needs, not to try to say right. I mean who needs oh to yeah no look of course I mean this is yeah that's the you know the, getting to the political. There's a reason why Ben Gurion you know the previous drafters you know left it at the level of a traditional connection because they're very wary of wading into this theological terrain. There's so much disagreement. Many anti-religious people there were you know already you know quite you know healthy religious. You know, people. You know, healthy religious contingent in 1948 as well, and so if you just leave it at like a fairly abstract level, then you have a kind of civil peace. Like there, there's like there's a reason for the compromise on that. No one's going to get really mad um, if you just leave it at yeah, book of books, and you and you don't you don't go into. Um, but the there's specifics no. Of but so I remind me, but there's so that is striking. There's no quotation from the Bible that, you know, God gave us this land. I mean, there are many places you could have cited, one could have cited that Ben Gurion was quite familiar with that would give a very particular biblical uh, justification for the Jews having this land, uh, but that he chose not to, right? I mean, he thinks that's that's too 
too much of a literalistic uh, grounding as it as it were. It, yeah, no, so exactly. So that that's a that's a that's striking absence. Interestingly, in this first draft, the, the draft I mentioned, Mord- Mordecai Baham, he did do this. Um, he put in the you know you know the you know that 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 direct quote from Deuteronomy, um, one version of the covenant, God, God, God's promise. Um, and that would have struck um, Ben Gurion to say nothing of his, you know, more secular, even a- atheist mind. That's like, um, you know, like a, 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 you know, not one bridge too far. That's like, you know, uh, you know, um, the, uh, way, way over the line, way too, way too theocratic, way too, you know, sim- simply religious, un- 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 unacceptable. And maybe um, not and great also, for I, diplomatic purposes either. Not, in terms of, yeah, not, know, not, yeah, Christian not great for diplomatic out there and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and look, Look, and, he, and it's like you know, and and, and also just it, it, exactly Christian na- nations out there. Every every nation in a way could claim some pro, you know, some some promise, some version of oh, we were we 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 have a promise to do this. Obviously, not as you know worked out and as you know uh, elaborate as the um, as as a Jewish mission, but you know a mission. Um, but um, the idea of being an elect people is not actually um, unique. Um, so that that I, I you know I you know I I would have you know I you know if, if if I were in charge of it I would have um you know potentially gone to something you know some some t- some text of the Bible but it would have been something you know explicating it's un- the universal mission of the Jewish people oh, the Jewish 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 people should continue you know looking elsewhere in Deuteronomy because of the wisdom of its laws the nations of the world will see that this is a wise and discerning people as Deuteronomy else, elsewhere states. Um, so there are other places to go. So, but but anyway, on, on the substance of those matters. So this was too theocratic. No, no direct quotation um, from the Bible. But Ben Gurion does attempt to distill, um, dist- to t- tell us something about the the universal Jewish mission and why that um, should um, continue. So that's on a question of religion. And what else? I just on also on religion. God is not directly mentioned or the, the word of God, the word, the, the name of God is not, not in the declaration. Is that right? So it, so this, so there's a question. I think it is. So the, the name, so Suri Yisrael at the conclusion of the declaration, um, the signers, you know, affix their trust in Suri Yisrael, the rock of Israel, um, which actually had been at that phrase, Suri Yisrael had been in the declaration from its very early earliest draft that had been a direct trend in the first instance baham baham mordechai baham had put that phrase in following the american declaration following this was an interesting translation um he chose for jefferson's you know firm reliance and in, in, in divine providence so that text had been in there um the and whole that's time, a very important phrase and it in survived. jewish prayer right and oh yeah the- it- yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Even you know, the, though though many in the room in, in the room weren't 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 traditional believers that day, everyone would have rec- recognized um, the phrase "Suri Yisrael, Rock of Israel" from um, from uh, from daily prayer service that they had attended in their in in uh, in their youth. Um, in the prayer book, it speaks of "Suri Yisrael Vegoalo, the Rock of Israel and its Redeemer," which uh, you know that 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 version of it is. You know, speaks more directly to an active, active God intervening. Yeah, and I think in, in Samuel, where I think that phrase is maybe most used in David's song, I guess it's called at the end of his life. I think it is Sri Israel Vagoelo. So, with some slight implication, well, there's the Rock of Israel, which keeps us safe, and that's very much David, what David's concern is. And then there's the redemption, which is sort of a different thing, you know, might say, then this is the more Zionist side of it, I would say, the, the rock yeah, of Israel, that's, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. And ben, Ben-Gurion, um, on the evening of May 13th, he mediated a debate between a rabbi who was on, you know, part of the executive committee, rabbi, you know, Rabbi um, Yehuda Leb uh, Fishman Maimon, um, and Aaron Zisling, a you know, far left Mapam member, and they argued precisely this point. Fishman said, oh, we need Galo, we need the rock of Israel's redeemer in there. And um, Zisling said, uh, I, I'm, I'm un- un- unhappy with this in general. Maybe we can have some, you know, Rock of Israel. It's fine if it's mentioned, but don't don't force upon don't don't say I don't force upon me to sign on. I believe um, in this. And what Ben Gurion Ben Gurion was proudest. You know, he he myth- he did some self mythologizing on the, on this line later on. Said, Oh, Surya Israel is a perfect compromise because a materialist um, could could uh, think of think of Rock of Israel in terms of Zionist strength. Um, you know, um, and, um, the, um, you know, believer, 
could could view it in terms of you know re- redeeming God who 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 is active um in in in, in redemption um there's still a third way you know our, our my my colleague James Diamond has has pointed this out it's possible to have a synthesis between between those two sides Rock of Israel think of it almost in Aristotelian terms the first you know, first principle uh, 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 of the world um and that's you know sort of Maimonidian use of the term rock sort of points us in in that direction so many way different ways to conceive it I was struck reading your account of uh, correct me if I'm wrong but they really you know uh, just coming to it fresh as it were for me I might have expected to see something about how about the promise of redemption and so forth and that is pretty much not, conspicuously not in the claimed in the declaration it's not it's not disclaimed <laughs> as it were it's just left for people to make up their own mind about whether this is to be you know a a, a theologically unbelievably important moment for theologically for Jews or whether it's uh very it's certainly a very important moment for the Jewish people <laughs> that's mm-hmm. made clear but yeah. I think that the rest is simply left up to people to make up their own mind I suppose right yeah there is there is no messianism in the document none 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 that I can none that I can see yeah Okay, so anything else on God and or religion and in the in the in the declaration? You no, know, I, I I think I think what I what I go to next is this discussion of rights. So this is okay. this is this is very important. So um, this this is the one where where you could say it's most um, ambiguous. Ben Gurion. Um, um, doesn't he also in the in the in the small hours of May thirteenth, um, he is thinking about the nature of rights. Um, what I what I want to what I want to say what, what I want to say about it. And he introduces like one important change from a previous draft. Previous drafts had mentioned um, that um, the state to be, and this is you know in um, you know the what the Supreme Court would later call the vision and credo part of the declaration, where it simply lists all kinds of things. The state will, you know, ensure complete social, political equality, freedom of religion, freedom, you know, freedom of language, all, all, all the all these kinds of things, many good good things, no doubt. And just take a minute on that, because people don't know that. I mean, the declaration itself guarantees or at least affirms that it's sh- that the forthcoming state should have, for example, religious freedom for non-Jews and equality of law for all sit- all citizens or all who are they reside there correct i mean that's oh ab, strike. it's not ab, a, that's not a later israeli supreme court liberal you know interposition so to speak into a much more jewish and zionist and particularist document no ab, absolutely right um let me just read that paragraph again the english translation the state of israel will be open for jewish Im- immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions and be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. So this is an exhaustive catalog of rights. And I think that, you know, they have animated you know, Israeli, uh, you know, is Israel's life in a very in an ennobling um, way. Um, one, what what Ben Gurion, you know, even in in the paragraph that yeah, so previous version that I, that I read, previous um, version had said the state will bestow rights on its inhabitants, i.e., it had like a, an extreme kind of statist, almost, you know. Socialist or, or you know, whatever you want to call it, notion that um, rights are you know sort of you know donations of a of a specific um, body. Ben Gurion in you know the final debate um, before um, you know b- before um, taking over the drafting process itself says, no, we've got to ch- change that. The state does not bestow rights; rights are inherent to the people. So he alters the language. To say the state will guarantee. Um, or make manifest tekayem in the Hebrew, the rights, the pre-existing rights. So he pushes um, pushes the document in that way, in a in a, in a direction that's closer to you know doctrine of inherent na- natural rights, which we you know we find you know so so wonderfully and so you know truly put you know I think in uh, America's Declaration of Independence. So he does that. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean this this list again is great. I'm like you know I'm happy that the you know state is you know commits itself uh, to. You know, many, 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 or most of the things we 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 just read, but it doesn't really state where they come from. It's just like it just it just puts them down in the document. And say we're going to do this and this and this. There's no just there's no um, political theory you could say as we have in America's Declaration, which which um, you know speaks of the origins where where these rights come from. 
um, you know, the, you know, in, you know, uh, you know, ha- ha- how they've been given according to the laws of nature and, and, and of nature's God. So that's, that's not in there. Um, and that's, that's actually real absence that, that, that creates a sort of confusion as to what, what, are, what are rights? Where, where, do, where do they come from? It doesn't, um, it doesn't allow the reader of this text to gain, uh, you know, sort of a theoretic, theoretically coherent, you know, a fully theoretically coherent account of, you know, the nature of rights and you know, the relationship of, you know, the state to the citizens and, you know, the rights. Again, I think ben- Ben-Gurion's change makes it, you know, pushes it to say they're inherent rights, but there is sort of a, the one, one could in a way come out of this saying like, oh, this is, you know, quite a, you know, the state is, um, you know, the, you know, the, the state has, um, you know, in uh, a, a monopoly on rights, but, you know, so that is, um, that's, I would say somewhat ambiguous. And, and by the way, so this list of, to go back to the UN question, this list, this catalog of rights, which I just mentioned is basically the language is basically ripped from UN resolution 181, UN resolution 181 and its specifications for the states, the to universalist be. Got, side of it. And yeah, then the they universe, add the Jewish side. Yeah, exactly. So exa- yeah. Exactly. The so gathering they add, of the exiles. Yeah. yeah, they get, yeah the, the, the UN, uh, to say the least, did not, um, yeah, did not, did not, um, mention anything about in gathering of exiles. Um, so, but, but the, but the catalog of rights, it, it, it did do so many of the choices which were made in this area and in others were rightly, again, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not castigating them for this were to satisfy, you know, the, the, the strictures, which the UN, um, had put forward. Well, say a word about the phrase historic and natural, right? I'm so interested in that. I find that interesting. And I would just say, incidentally, slightly contrary to, I mean, we think the American Declaration like really lays out the grounds of this. I mean, does it really? It's like two sentences that are asserted. The laws of nature and nature's God, incidentally, are in the context of the separate and equal station our nation is entitled to. Really? So nature and nature's God just decided that that there are a bunch of nations that have to have a separate and equal status. So I would say we we read Locke back into it, which is appropriate. They don't have Locke in a certain way, or they don't unambiguously have Locke. I think it's also a Jewish state, and because it's a different century and so forth. And so, I, I don't know. I think you know one, one could overdo how much uh, the, the, even the U.S. Declaration is, you know, one hundred percent grounds it one hundred percent obviously in this ambiguity about the creator and so forth. So anyway, just yeah. oh yeah, sure. I'm not. Uh, yeah, I don't have a, by by no means do I'm I want to defending you know, it a little produce more. A, no, no, area, you know. <laughs> no, no, I'm yeah, no, I'm defending it also. I mean, it just. You know, as an yeah. as an as an as an interesting side note, the first translation of uh, Locke's two treatises of government was done in 1948 in Hebrew. That's sort of a wow. and, 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 so and it wasn't and, really and it just, a thing. I mean, they were so one forgets that they were so influenced by German thought and Marxist thought and 20th century thought that it's it, for us it's a Locke, yes, you know, but that wasn't they weren't yeah, sitting it, it, thinking a lot it, about Locke, yeah. Yeah, very much. Yeah, it, it, it was it was very much not of their world. Their world was a world of of Central Europe um, and it, its intellectual traditions, the the Marxist socialism, which had taken, you know, the ideological van, vanguard to this, you know, swampy, swampy, swampy land yeah. in the poorest region of the world um, in uh, the late 19th and 20th century. So it wasn't of their world. But I think part of, you know, Ben Gurion's brilliance is he. Again, I'm not I'm not advocating for Israel to be you know, to copied America directly, um, but he does, I think, through some of these changes and just overall, he pushes it in a direction that's, you know, you know, more, you could say, small L, more in accord with, um, well, yeah, more more liberal democratic um, you know, vision. And say a word about that phrase, just that always struck me. So, is it's historic and natural, right? I think not natural and natural, natural, natural and historic, and historic, and, right? And, and, and so, historic, what is that in Hebrew? Historical, that's... right? Schut TV for history. Yeah. So right um, by, by nature. Yeah, nature and, and, and history. So look, so yeah, I think. And I th- what's the I, context I th- of that in the declaration? That's. So I, I so I think we've gotten there by un- unpacking it. The schut, the natural right part of it is this so, is this question of sovereignty this is that that's but what's the, the literal the, context i mean what in what sentence does it, it appears in a sentence that, that it is an important moment right it's not just random i mean it, it's sort of well it's 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 taken to be important by me but that that wasn't the applause line I in see. um in, in in the room that day the applause line was you know then you know the naming of the state you know for the end uh you know the you know this the termination of of, of the mandate um accordingly we members well you know uh, accordingly me, we members of the people's council representatives of the jewish community of eretz israel and of the zionist movement are here assembled on the day of the termination of british mandate over eretz israel and by virtue of our natural natural and historic right and on the strength of the resolution of the united nations general assembly hereby declare the establishment of a jewish state in israel to 
to be known as the state of Israel. Forgive me. Yes, it is in a, you know, in ma- a major language. applause line <laughs> paragraph. But so I think my interpretation- but very fleetingly, and, I mean, in a way, right? Yeah, Not a lot of very, unpacking there. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but it, it follows, I think, from, you know, again, the interpretations may differ on this. So I see the, you know, we, we argue um, in the book, I see the natural right side of it as expressing this sovereign sovereignty, the natural right of the people to be sovereign, to be free of, you know, the, the strictures of foreign powers. We've earned this. Um, this is our, our, our natural right. And historic right is not history in, in, in some Hegelian sense. It could be read that way, right? And then the natural tendency is just to say, oh, by virtue of tradition. But I think in, in Ben-Gurion's uh, uh, account, it is this... Um, you know, that flows back to this uh, attempt to universalize the Jewish experience on the basis of the book of books. The Jews have done important work in antiquity. Um, that um, that mission has been, you know, the Jews have suffered grievously um, and have suffered grievously precisely by their you know, commitment um, to, to that to that mission and, and, and to that project. Um, and, they're, and, they're, and they're and they're deserving of um, independence to carry to carry that torch forward. We are tor- torch bearers for the treasures, um, for the principles as contained in the book of books. That's the historic right, I think, once you once you get down to it. So it's not really so it's not it's not um it's it's phrased as histor- as a historic right, which I think is a you know, it doesn't it doesn't get to the core of the matter, but it reaches toward um, a core, which is, I think, you know, qu- quite defensible if um, containing its own ambiguities, to be sure, as well. Yeah, and it is, I think, a consciously not divine right, let's just put it that way. The historic right implies, of course, what is the Book of Books about, you know, but it it's a one step removed, you might say, and therefore a little less... Uh... Well, maybe you can get more consensus on on that phrase. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. No. The 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 drive to have consensus. I mean, the the kind of fractious. You know, new. new I don't think it's a newsflash to anyone. You know, Jew, Jewish people have been frac. The Jews have been fractious politically. You know, in um in in Palestine. You know, many different parties. Um, so many different sensibilities on religious, political matters, and so on. So just find, finding um acceptable words that could be signed signed upon. Um, was no 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 small feat, um, and um, the there is there was a ton of practical merit in this in the in this in this compromise which was established because no no one is no one is perfectly happy religious people who want to see like a full full throated oh we're we're here because God promised us a land and we're 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 going to live according to um uh, live live according to the law um, they're not perfectly satisfied. Um, but on the other hand, they're not totally unsatisfied because it, it like it, 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 it permits that kind of life. Um, and on the other hand, um, you know, the not, non, non-religious are not, not perfectly satisfied because it does do this. Like, it, you know, the Declaration of Independence begins with, you know, the, you know, the book of books, it begins with, um, you know, cultural, cultural, you know, c- cultural treasures of, um, you know, of, um, of, uh, of, of, of the Jewish world. Um, and yet there, you know, and, and there, and there's going to be religion in the state and this is going to annoy them and, and so on. But, um, um, they, it's, 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 it's practically something, something they can live with. So there is, there was merit in the compromise and, you know, Israel's ability to hang together through thick and thin, mostly, mostly thick, um, does, does put, does put a point in, um, in, 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 in the favor of these sort of compromise, uh, phrases, which exist in the declaration. Yeah. There's a lot of merit. Or in that. And it is signed, is it not, by delegates ranging from, I think, a communist uh, party member to to rabbis, to, to orthodox rabbis? Yeah, the whole range. So 30, 30, 37 members of the full, um, the new, newly established um, you know, proto-parliament of the state. Every, everyone signs it. One revisionist politely asked, oh, can I like sign it with like with uh can i can i can i only sign partially because i don't believe in uh any language about the un he relents he just he just signs it he's a w- wonderful guy you know the communist signed it this you know far left atheist aron ziesling who you know caused ben gurion's so many so many troubles here and and elsewhere he signs it too so it is able you know the the whole you know it it it, it is it is signed upon by the you know the whole political um establishment you could say of uh, the the Jewish community and and you know and and of Israel. I mean, there's a whole another conversation we should have about sort of how the Declaration plays out, either Quad Declaration or just the themes of it. You might say in uh, uh, tension and in, in in Israeli history and the Supreme Court and the liberal side of 
Israel and the religious side, if you want to put it that way, or the it's a Jewish and democratic state, but that's probably too much for the few minutes we, we have left. So maybe, maybe better to focus uh, for, uh, now on Ben Gurion. I just, we've, he's come up so much, but let's step back a little from the, uh, you know, the, the details of his role in, in, in getting the declaration done and, and proclaiming it, or even 47, 48, and talk about him just as, I suppose he's the closest to the George Washington of Israel. So, I mean, what about him as a statesman? And uh, people don't know. People, there are biographies one could read. Maybe you could recommend one or two. But I don't know, I'm just curious. What just just what you know, he seems like he. I mean, he was hugely famous, and of course revered by Jews. At least when I was growing up, you know, some American Jews and, and so forth. But I feel like actually studying him as a statesman that hasn't been done quite as much. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, there have been some beginnings of it, but this is, I mean, it's really, in a way, this whole story is a, is, is a story of Ben Gurion and my, and, and in a way working on you know, the founding of Israel is my, is sort of my education and growing admiration for Ben Gurion. I, I, you know, I started, I came into this, like, you know, obviously like, you know, recognizing his, you know, his, his talents, his judgment, you know, in, in you know, in founding the state and leading it and so on, you know, re regaled with, you know, stories about, you know, many, many, many of his uh, accomplishments. But I had sort of on the level, you know, on this question of statesmanship, which, you know, you know, our, our, you know which um, we've, we've been, uh, you know, our, our friends have been studying for so long. I had sort of a, you know, lesser view. I was sort of, you know, he had like in later life, there's this image, you know, he's very, he was into, you know, a, a yoga like practice called Feldenkrais or photos of him standing on his head. You know, always like quirk, quirky stories of his sort of, uh, of his, you know, of his, um, you know, supposed learning in Greek and the Bible and, you know, his meeting with scholars. I, I thought there was like a, you know, of, you know, simply, you know, facile vanity. I just like, oh, I'm concerned with, you know, um, you know, burnishing my legacy and, you know, I'm going to pretend to be, you know, in, engaged in the world of ideas. It's it's not actually true. I mean, you look at it and it just like you're astonished by what he was able to to do and to learn. Um, Walter Lecure, the you know late wonderful historian of Zionism and the Holocaust, many other matters. He, I think, put it well. You know, he talks referring to Ben Gurion and other you know labor Zionist leaders as well. They, you know, they, you know, beginning in the tens, nineteen tens, nineteen twenties, they were like these really these trade union guys. Their concerns were very parochial. Uh, their knowledge of the world was very limited. Um, ben Gurion was, you know, a guy from you know a, a small village in Poland. Yes, yeah, I heard about just when does he, where does he grow up, when does he come to Israel, what's his yeah, education? So yeah, so he um so he was born in 1886 in a in a place called Plonsk um in Poland part of part of part of the Russian Empire sort of north uh, west uh, I think about 70 miles uh from 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 Warsaw. Um he's from a Zionist family. This was this, this was kind of important. His father was active in the Lovers of Zion movement. Um he you know and when Herzl died in 1904 he reports weeping, you know, feeling he lost his uh North Star. Um, and his he, name, um, of course, go, is not D David Ben Gurion at that point. Right? Oh yeah, David David Grun, David Green, something like that. And Ben Gurion was a, a rebel against uh, Roman rule over Palestine. Very, very, very apropos. He changes his name, um, and he sort of he comes to uh, a Palestine which is still under Ottoman rule, and there's basically nothing there. Um, this is in. 1906 1907 something like that 1906 1907 um is when um is when he comes um he works briefly as a day laborer there's literally like in you know in like a small settlement in the north um and he sort of finds himself in you know as a later later policy was like community organizing right i mean he gets very involved in 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 um you know organizing a union and political party Achtud Avoda. Um, and he, um, he sort of through these experiences he had through, you know, the union, union business and, and political business, creating a political party out of this, he sort of grows and grows as a, a statesman. Um, some of our revisionist friends criticize him at some points, like, oh, he was, he was behind. He, he certainly made some errors. You know, he didn't, he didn't see Britain, um, you know, when World War One began, he was still like, oh, the Ottomans are going to do well. Maybe, you know, he was a bit late sometimes. He could have potentially been a bit late about the United States, you know, the growing role of the United States in the world. But by 1948, he was a man who had really, really developed a you know, comprehensive view of the, you know, we could say balance of forces that um, that uh, the Jews of Palestine faced. And partially it was based on this experience, but also, also partially by reading books. I mean, he really, you know, he spent, you know, formative years in the United States. Um, he knew America's Declaration of Independence, for instance. 
Um, he sort of fell in love with Plato and Aristotle in addition to the Bible. During World War II, he's in London. He didn't have much to do. He's just like during the Blitz, he was like reading Plato's laws all day, you know, this kind of thing. So he actually, there was, there was um this growth of this growth that he had um and this like ability to um you know see see political things as as they are was astonishing and it's really a point in favor of democratic it's two things a point in favor of democratic citizenship like oh actually you 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 think this 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 guy will go narrow nowhere no actually if he's given this freedom you can actually go 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 pretty far and also just so, you know the, like the Jewish, lincoln i mean so no formal education to speak no of, for, right? he would been i mean he like he like couldn't get like and it's uh compared to his colleagues some of you had fancy degrees you know, many the German lawyers that, you know, working at the upper echelons of Jewish settlement, you know, had studied, you know, fancy degrees from Heidelberg and, you know, Berlin and other places. He like was in a Polish technical college. He was in a law school in Istanbul that he flunked out of. So he was, um, you know, this, this, uh, auto, uh, you know, an, an autodidact if there ever, ever was one. But I think also in addition to, you know, this is what I said about democratic statesmanship, just uh, like the inheritance of the world of Judaism, which he, you know, um, which he still, again, not raised in a religious household, but, you know, some, you know, a- aspects of, of that world had certainly left his mark um, on his character and, and his, you know, readings of the Bible and, you know, uh, 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 other things really helped him to it helped him to grow um, into the statesman he became by uh, by 1948. No, that's really fascinating. And he, apart from your book, which I will remind people, Israel's Declaration of Independence. You and Dove Ziegler, people should order that immediately and uh, pre-order it. I guess it'll hopefully out early in the new year, though. Um, any uh, particular things that you found helpful in terms of either accounts of the founding or historical accounts of the 47, 48, the war, and so forth, or and or biographies or studies of Ben-Gurion. I'm just, I think people would appreciate that. Yeah. Tom Segev's recent biography of Ben-Gurion um, is not extremely friendly. Like the author, it's a wonderful book. The author is not totally friendly to Ben-Gurion, but in spite of that, I think you see like his you know, sort of statesman education of um, uh, uh, a, a, as a statesman. So that comes out. And that's in English, that's translated in English. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah every, every, everything I'll mention is in English. So that, that's one. Another work I'd mention is Zev Sternhell, um, also, also recently died, a uh, you know scholar of you know both both French and uh, you know Jewish things. His work, the founding founding myths of um, uh, of Israel. This this goes into the you know a great study of the you know the core of labor Zionist um, teachings um, and what what is, he he considers you know b- betrayal of. Um, uh, you know, b- betrayal of its mission by leading labor Zionists, but very provocative and helpful um, on the declaration. And this maybe, you know, we can discuss some other time. You know, this is, you know, Aharon Barak, um, you know, who was a chief justice of Israel's Supreme Court, you know, was the you know, dominant thinker, you could say, of Israel preceding generation. He has reflected a lot on the declaration and its role um, in Israel's life. And I, you know, I just, you know, I, you know fancy, fancy myself disagreeing with him in, in some respects, but, um, you know, it's, um, um, he's he's been uh, you know, a very important figure. And it just goes to show that, you know, this question of, you know, the de- declaration of the principles of Israel's founding are going to be, you know, I, you know, I see them becoming more and more relevant you know, in, in, in the coming years in Israel. No, that's great. Well, that's another conversation we will have. We'll have to have. We should have. This has been terrific. Neil, anything we haven't covered that you want to mention or that uh, people need to think about, but uh, they can, well, they can learn more from the book and from other readings and uh, think themselves about the, you know, honestly about the declaration and about, uh, one thing I was struck by in your book, I'm not very well educated in things Jewish or Israeli, and um, it's, but it's quite accessible. You don't have to be, people shouldn't be intimidated, I would say to our audience here that, uh, you know, uh, why I haven't, you know, don't know Hebrew or I haven't studied this much or, you know, uh, mm-hmm. it's just like the American Declaration, a little bit of background, obviously, you need, is helpful, but you provide that. But the, it's really, uh, if you're interested in politics and political philosophy and history, uh, religion, uh, culture, you know, um, 20th century, uh, there's there's a lot, uh, the, the book's accessible. So that's, that's, that's a tribute to you and to, and to your co- co-author. Yeah. No. No. Thank. Thank you very much. That's that's great to hear. One. One thing I would I would say is if you know, especially for young people, I would encourage them if they're thinking about Israel and the Israeli founding, to think of it not only in terms of as you, as you mentioned earlier the history of Zionism, but political philosophy, the whole tradition of political thought. You know, from from Plato, from Machiavelli, through to, through to John Locke, um, and and nineteenth century thinkers. Once you start doing that, um, I think a whole host of provocative questions. 
open up that are ripe for reflection on, on the nature of modern Israel, but also you know, in politics, simply using Israel to think well, one can use Israel to think about our um, political um, possibilities, of course, not neglecting the Jewish Jewish sources and uh, and, and Zionism um, as well. So I think I th that was very important for me. And I, you know, I think it could be you know, helpful for others. No, that's an excellent note. To, and uh, Neil, thanks for thanks for joining me today. And and everyone should go out and buy the book. Uh, needless to say, and recommend it to others. And and uh, you know, discuss it and have discussion uh, study groups and get in touch with Neil to invite him to discuss it. And, and his co-author Dov Ziegler. So Neil, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, and thank you for joining us on conversations. <laughs>